I finished the main storyline of Avatar Frontiers of Pandora and I've played over 40 hours so far so I'm going to share some of the things that I wish I'd known sooner before playing the game so you can hopefully have a more enjoyable experience with a little less head scratching. I also won't be giving away any main storyline spoilers here so you're all gravy there and my thanks to Ubisoft for slinging me across a review code so I could get these tips and tricks out to you very swiftly. And let's go over some exploration restrictions first because if you want to fly around the whole of Pandora then you'll need to follow the main narrative storyline until each of the three regions of the map unlocks. Because if you don't, you won't be able to jump on your Ikran and explore everything in this game until you complete those three storyline quests of each clan. But just to be clear, you won't finish the main storyline if you do decide to complete each of these regional quests for each of these three Navi clans, which takes approximately around 15 or so hours. It just means that you've opened up the whole world after meeting the Kamatir clan in the Clouded Forest region. Additionally, when flying to a new quest or objective in this game, make sure you check your map frequently as it will slowly defog when you're in the vicinity or flying above the land and when it does start to unfog in Pandora make sure you fly down and discover these purple points of interest markers like field station and Navi camps as they will increase the visibility range on your world map as well as adding fast travel points to your game. Additionally whilst you're exploring you can zoom out to a point on the map like I'm doing here where you'll be able to visually see the regional blue barriers which will help you find undiscovered areas within each of the three regions and a nice tip here if you find yourself on a ledge or a cliff or high up somewhere just jump off it and then trigger your mount it's way easier to do that than calling for it whistling for it waiting for it to land and then mounting it and waiting for that mounting animation to finish and you can even do it quite close to the ground as well which is good to know now combat strength is this game's leveling system where equipping higher quality armor and weapons will subsequently increase your combat levels so you are then able to efficiently complete quests and the main storyline which has its own recommended combat level which is shown on the quest log and map as you can see here. I actually completed the game at a combat level of 14 when the end mission was recommended at level 18 as an FYI so it is possible to somewhat ignore this feature if you do want to just focus on the story but it will be a lot more challenging. However to increase your combat level it's important for you to know that the only weapons that are in your quick slot weapon will contribute to your overall strength level as well as your gear those being the head, chest, arm, waist and ankle pieces which means if it's not equipped it's it then won't boost your strength or combat level essentially. Now a quick way to gain a level or two early on is to unlock the well prepared skill which allows you to add another weapon to your weapon wheel and equip modifications to your weapons and gear that may be lying unused in your infantry. Speaking of which if you click on your combat level pane in this infantry screen you get a full breakdown of your main stats, perks and bonuses of your equipment which I didn't realize for several hours after playing so that's good to know that that's there as well to really understand what you're working with early on in the game but speaking of early on in the game I was really keen to get my hands on certain weapons that had been showcased before launch only to find out that they all unlock as you play through the story so by the time that you've completed your final clan mission in that third region that being the clouded forest you will have the heavy bow long bow short bow spear thrower staff sling assault rifle shotgun stun grenades and the RPG which is only available in specific crates in certain areas by the way so you can't keep it in your weapon wheel permanently in fact if you do pick it up and then switch back to your bow so you don't fire it it then disappears so make sure that you fire off those three rockets before you then switch back to another weapon now as for ammo you can't craft firearms or bullets in this game you need to loot them in chests and outposts however even though there's no button to loot enemies make Make sure you do run over the AMPs and human bodies when you defeat them as they do drop decent amounts of ammo and spare parts that automatically hit your inventory which I also overlooked early on in the game. Additionally make sure that you swap ammo types by pressing right on your controller d-pad when opening the weapon wheel. It's way more effective to do this than going into the menus to then manually switch it out especially when you're in a combative pinch with the RDA because there's no kind of temporary pause feature in this game. Now as I just mentioned outposts let's go through some tips and tricks when you do approach them in Pandora. First of all make sure you've got enough health pots which are called daffofets and are these particular marks on your health bar as well as enough sticks to then be able to craft arrows. There's also no melee combat weapons in this game and if you're out of ammo and health you cannot punch the whole outpost to death so this is why it's important to come prepared otherwise you're gonna have to run away and then come back. Speaking of which clearing the whole outpost 
isn't actually the objective in this game as the enemies keep respawning after you kill them. In fact, the game wants you to play in a stealth focused way and you will be rewarded handsomely for doing so because if you complete the outpost while stealth, which takes around 15 to 20 minutes for the big ones if you're pretty good, you'll enter the loot room at the end and you will get a lot more chests compared to if you just ran around with your shotgun blowing everyone to pieces. And the reason being, if you actually alert the outpost to your presence, they'll take half the loot from their secret storage base out of the compound for safekeeping, which means less loot for you. So if you are spotted and reinforcements do arrive, you can just quit to the main menu and then press continue and the game will just then respawn you back outside for another go. Now, if you've learned something new so far or you're enjoying the video, please do leave a very quick like down below. And also please do consider using the Andy Reloads credit code next time you're in the Ubisoft store as I get a very small pushback. It's the best way to support me and you get one cent or one penny off your purchase, which is a quality deal. Now, moving on, since we're on the topic of combat, here's a couple tips and tricks for you to know. Firstly, if you're wiping or you keep dying on a hardcore storyline boss fight and for the life of you, you cannot defeat these AMPs that keep coming at you, then make sure you check your weapon wheel because if you are out of resources for crafting certain projectiles, then the game will lower what's mandatory in terms of crafting. And that's because it recognizes that you're having a tough time and it's kind of giving you a helping hand in replacing replenishing your offensive capabilities for free, basically, which I think is a good thing. Additionally, when you do collect your short bow, I would recommend using it like a hip fire SMG weapon, as it's not necessary to actually aim with it, as it has a very forgiving hip fire lock or aim assist, which is super fun to use when you start jumping off ledges and quickly no scoping enemies with it. I'd also really recommend you utilize the staff sling with the mines that then explode. They pretty much one shot all AMPs, like every single AMP that I came across with in the game. And this actually allowed me this weapon is solely responsible for me completing the game at level 14 and I wouldn't be surprised if they nuke it in an upcoming patch to be honest with you. On top of that, when you are at an outpost, try hacking all of the AMPs and then unleashing the hack over power button to then immobilize them. It's a pretty cool feature and you can then just run through the whole base with ease. Now there's over 60 skill points to spend in this game and they're pretty easy to come by as you can obtain skill points by collecting the Tarasu flowers and saplings throughout the world as you can see here. So in that regard, when when you're just starting out in the King Law Forest, I recommend you spend your points in a few specific areas, which will then have a compounding effect the longer that you play. The first being the well-prepared skill, which is the one that we spoke about earlier, which opens up that fourth weapon slot to buff your combat strength. I'd also recommend spending points until you unlock the vigor or vitality skill points, which grants you more energy and health. And I can't tell you how frustrating it is to get two shotted by an enemy or run out of energy for sprinting or flying until you eat some food. So just get these skills as soon as you can because it will give you a little bit more breathing room throughout the game. Another skill worth investing in is the Light-Footed Hunter 2, which removes noise from any sort of movement that you make in this game, which is really solid, especially when you're in outpost. You can literally just sprint around one-shotting everyone. And since I'm recommending different skills here in different trees, I'd also say unlock the Flying Takedown skill in the Rider Tree, which allows your Ikran to one-shot aircraft, which will be very useful in the story, by the way, just as a heads up. Now, those main skills aside, there's also two further categories of skills you need to be aware of, those being 11 Ancestor and 5 Apex skills, with the former being abilities that should take priority in the early game, to be honest with you, as they grant powerful new moves for free, essentially, as all you need to do is approach these large Tarasu flowers in the wild, which are the pink pillars of light on the map. Now, as an example of how good they are, this is how you're going to be able to get the Shell Breaker move, which allows you to pull out AMP pilots from their mech suits, and if you then combine that with the drop impact ancestor skill, you can then melee attack amps from the air and then pull them out of their suits, which is super fun to trigger. Now, as for apex skills though, these are quests you can get for unlocking all skill points in just one tree, where you'll then be able to earn a cool ability as a reward, such as the survivor skill called second wind that allows you to self res if you do die. So hover your icon over each skill tree and find one that you like best, and then pretty much just spend all your skill points in that tree until you get the quest that pops up so you can get that cool ability. Now, one of the best things about this game, in my opinion, is you can actually play with a friend in co-op, but you'll only be able to join each other's game after you complete the main story quest called the Aranahe Clan, which takes approximately around three or four hours of memory serves, depending upon how fast you play. Now, once you're both past that point, you can boot up your main menu and click on co-op, making sure that you're both friends on Ubisoft Connect because you can actually play this game on different consoles and PC, so it's cross-play enabled by default. Now, important to note, this isn't a 
split screen game, you both need to have a version of the game and a console for it to work with one player acting as the host of the session and the other being the guest. This also means that quests, activities and collectibles do not need to be recollected or replayed in a solo capacity as your friend will keep everything they earn in the co-op session, including gear, items and collectibles. Just make sure you're both showing online on Ubisoft Connect and not offline, by the way, otherwise it won't work. Nika and I learned that the hard way. Now, what about replayability in this game? Well, after you complete the storyline of each region, a level 20 fortress will spawn, and that is the kind of end game content of this game, if you will. This actually pops up in your quest log, which will then lead on to other fortresses, but after that, at the time of playing and recording, there's nothing else that I can find to do except for wait for the expansion in summer 2024, and after you complete all of the side quests and world events, that is. Now, that said, I did speak to the developers in interviews in person before the game came out, who did tell me that there are some super exciting secrets that are incredibly well hidden in Pandora, and they're very much looking forward to us, the players, finding them. So if you do find anything, make sure you do come back to this video and let me know. I also want to quickly mention infantry management here, because there's going to be a point where you get that dreaded infantry is full warning in this game when out collecting resources. So to combat this, you can spend points in the maker skill tree to increase your infantry space, or dump lots of stuff into your Navi bank bag at every outpost you come in contact with, which took me way too long to realize that I could do that in game. Now, there's a few secret settings here that you should also consider turning on while you play through this game, as you'll likely find it more enjoyable. The first is the autocomplete SID hacking feature and the autocomplete SID lock-on feature, which means that when you do approach all of these hackable devices in the game, the option is there for you to complete them quickly. And there's so many of these mini games in Avatar, you're gonna end up getting PTSD <laughs> if you don't consider actually turning these settings on after a few hours. Now, another one is the memory paintings where you can also auto complete them as well if you're struggling with this hand-eye coordination mini game. And also try turning off the gathering complexity feature in the settings because you'll be able to pick fruit and resources instantly, but you will lose the performance bonus in doing so, which is something to bear it in mind. Now, I've got even more tips and tricks for you in this video, which should be on your screen right now or my face right now. So give that a click so you can get even more out of this game and I'll see you there in just a second. But if you're still here, my huge thanks to to Sylvia, Liam, Jenny, and Chris at Ubisoft, and my co-content creator, Nika, who's joined me and helped me in early access. Coffee's on all of them. Thanks for stopping by, and hopefully I'll see you in that next video.